5 and the first 10 verses of chapter 6. Let me give you kind of a heads up as to what is going on here right before this last, last verse so that you'll get it in the context uh, that, uh, that, that you're reading it. Uh, uh, Haman has just come back home from the first banquet. Stomach's full. He's elated. He, 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 he's on top of the world. It seems like everybody, the king's honoring him. The queen's honoring him. Everything's going well. He's on the top of the world. Then he passes Mordecai. And Mordecai doesn't do like all the others. He doesn't vow. And it just sends Haman into a rage. Haman goes home. Uh, tells all the good things to his friends and his family of what is happening with, with the King Xerxes and Queen Esther and all these things. And then he goes on a rant, his rant about Mordecai. And then verse 14 is what they suggested that he, that he, he does, and which he in fact did. So that's the context that, that, uh, that his text is in. Okay, let's uh, let's read let's read through our text uh, uh, together, and we can then we'll look at uh, uh, any observations that we have. Uh, verse number fourteen of chapter five reads like this: Then his wife Zeresh and all his friend, his friends said to him, and that is the payment, Let a gallows be made fifty cubits high, and in the morning suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it. Then go merrily with the king to the banquet. And the king pleased, and, and the thing pleased Haman. So he had the gallows made. Chapter 16. That night the king could not sleep. So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bithana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers, who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. Then the king said, What honor or dignity had been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. So the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's servants said to him, Haman is there, standing in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in and the king asked him, What shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which is a royal crest placed on its head. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of the one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robe and the horse as you have suggested, 
And do so for Mordecai the Jew, who sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. All right, observations. Isn't that? I think Hammond's day just went downhill really quick. It is. It, 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 it's, it's, it's getting. It's getting. It's getting bad. It's getting. It, it's getting bad. It, 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 one day he has the best day of his life. The next day it's. It's the worst day of his life, and it only gets worse <laughs> from that from, from that from that point. Uh, uh, it, so, so what do you any, any anything that jumps out to you that you kind of noticed about? Uh, yes, ma'am. I think God has a sense of humor because he goes in intending to ask the king to kill this guy, and he ends up setting up the, his own way to honor him, and he has to do it. Absolutely. It's just, it's, it, I mean, God just plays this just so that, 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 that it, it's just, you have to laugh. You have to laugh that, that, that all this just, uh, it doesn't just backfire on him. It, everything turns upside down on him. Yes? Well, and, and the thing is, the, the first banquet, why did, why did um, Esther do one banquet and do a second. Because if she hadn't done the second, the king wouldn't have. And what made the king not be able to sleep and decide to ring, read the records? Otherwise, yeah. nothing would have happened with yeah. Mordecai. I just, I just can't help but, but see the hand of the Holy Spirit in that and that he didn't give her peace to do that at, at that moment. Mm -hmm. And it just played right into God's time. Ryan, mm -hmm. did you? Um, yeah, pride cometh before a fall. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and God loves to entangle the proud. He really, so that, let that be a warning, not just to people out there, but to our lives as well, that once we begin to get proud and once we begin to think that we're, we're in control of all this, uh, uh, we're going to find ourselves on the, on, the, on, on, the, on, the, on the sorry end of that deal. That's for sure. Yeah. Any, anyone else? Any other observations that you notice about? I was just thinking that during the, the second banquet, there's going to be a lot of tired people. Because obviously Haman, Haman was busy because, mm -hmm. you know, he was having to get a gallows built, so surely he didn't get much sleep. And then, um, you know, and then the king didn't get much sleep. So by the time the second banquet was coming, it was going to probably be... Yeah. Well... Uh, and, and, was and, it and, the second night, or was, well, it, was there time passed? Actually, no, actually, if you read the rest of this chapter, and feel free to read the rest of this chapter, Haman has to do what he just suggested that be done. Mm -hmm. He has to do that for Mordecai. So he's spending the rest of his day going through the streets on, in front of a horse declaring, mm -hmm. declaring uh, 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 b before the people of, of, more of, of, what, of how blessed Mordecai was. And the, and, and, the, and the text actually says that when he goes home that night, he shrouds his head. He is just, he is just, he is, he is at his wit's end. He's miserable. He's angry. He's frustrated. And, and, he, and, he, and he walks in and two things happen. His wife looks at him and basically says, Mordecai will be your end. That's what basically what she, what she says. We'll look, look at that text. And then, King Servants. We're here to, to escort you to the, the banquet of Esther. That's how quickly. Uh, this thing snowballs. It snowballs. Just boom. All these events, just one, one, one right after the other. You know, sometimes we wait forever for God's hand to move and God to touch and God to you to work in our life. And then uh, in, in, in a single moment, he just seems to cause the domino effect. Boom, this happens, that happens, and things begin to take place. Yes. Well, I noticed, too, though, it says, then his wife, Zeresh, and all his friends said to him. Exactly. Exactly. It's like, you know, they're encouraging him to do it. He didn't just yeah. come up with this out on his own. That's right. Watch what friends you listen to. <laughs> yeah. these, these and then people, his wife said, you're going to hang. <laughs> well, yeah, later, she's, oh, later she, didn't, she was quick to say, you know, you're going to, you know, I believe that Mordecai's going to be your, your downfall, you know. Yes, James. On that note, it's just striking how evil it really is what they suggested. I mean, they basically say, go kill the guy that's bothering you. And then have a good time and thank you. Like, just like, you know. <laughs> yes, okay, it, it, it is cool in a way how promptly God just counters that. It's like, you're not doing that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's, that's for sure. It's just, it, 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 blow, it blows her mind at the, at the whole strategy. Yes, it's Another thing that's kind of interesting like it's the whole that whole timing thing is here too just like with Esther being out and 
um, out in the open when she was like mm -hmm. Haman out in the open like he was mm -hmm. instead of it being someone else. That, that, that's right. That's right. We're gonna see a, we're gonna see a, a, the major hand that God's timing has in, in in all of these events. There are so many events that had to go off at the time they went off for all this to happen the way it happened. We, I mean, you you're gonna see the, you're gonna see you know God's God's hand in, and and timing in, in, in it all. And so yes, it's powerful message there about about uh, about the, the God's God's time. And, when, and and just relying on that time, you know, the way Esther had, had, had come to rely on that time. The fact that Mordecai is the center of two completely different plans. He, <laughs> he is the center point for the king and a center point for Haman with two completely different plans, and yet he hasn't changed one bit. He is yes, steadfast. Yes. Where does Haman see him? At the gate, where he always is. He, right. He's not changed in what we read somewhere between five and six years. He's done the same thing day after day after That's day right. after day. That's right. And it's not changed. He never looked for any glory. He never looked for any trouble. He, he stood steadfast with God. And the divine part is you see, when I, when I read this this last week, it was like, what are we part of a plan that we don't even know we're part of? Absolutely. Absolutely. That God is protecting us, keeping us from, mm -hmm. leading us to where we need to be and all, all that. And we don't know what the deceiver Satan has for us That's we, right. because we're staying in God's will. And what I found it, kind of jumping ahead a little bit, one thing I found interesting in all this is when Haman got all upset, mm -hmm. the closest we come to seeing God mentioned in this is in the last part of chapter 6 where he said, if, they, if he is of Jewish descent, you can't fight him. It's what it is. The people that told him to do all these things before are now telling him, you're, you're in a world of hurt, mister. You, yes. you shouldn't be fighting with this guy. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's shocking just how, how, the, how, the, yeah, uh, uh, how all of this just becomes the... Uh, and don't think you know, this is Esther, somebody special, and this is Mordecai, somebody special. They were both very common Jewish people at the start of this story. And it was just that they surrendered their lives to God's will. And when we do that, we put our hands into God's plan. And we begin to see, we begin to see that uh, take, take place. And, and I believe Esther speaks, speaks straight to us, doesn't it? Straight to us in, 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 in that way. Any other observations that you noticed in our, in, in our text? All right. Well, let's take a, let's take a quick, quick uh, tour of what has been taking place. This is actually our, our seventh lesson uh, tonight. Uh, on, on Esther, let's take a quick tour as to what has, what has transpired and what has taken, taken place here. First of all, we see at the be very beginning of the story, it's, it's amazing that oftentimes, you know, a love story just leads up to the, this climax, but actually it starts that way in that God turns the common Esther, uh, 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 Hadashah, which was a young Jewish girl, into Queen Esther. He orchestrates things where, where she is in that position and in that place, yet no one knows that she's Jewish. She, they are in Persia, mind you. The, the, the children of Israel have been captured, has been taken to a foreign land, and they were at, at, the, at the whims of, an, of a wicked, evil king by the name of Xerxes. But God orchestrates it so that Hadasha would become the queen of Persia. Five years later, Haman... Haman is a Haman is uh, becomes the villain here. Haman, we we noticed that Haman had, was from a, from was from a, the Amalekites, which was a was a, an evil clan. But he had planned because Mordecai Esther's cousin would not bow before him. He had made a law and basically tricked the king into into giving him permission to pass a law that would, in eleven months' time, annihilate all the Jews. All of them throughout the entire Persian Empire, and you need to realize that this was a vast area of the of, of the uh, civilized world at, at the time. And so, so that was Haman's law. 
uh, Mordecai comes before, uh, come, well, sends word to Esther, you have to do something. But Esther reminds him, I, I just can't walk into the king's courtroom. If I walk into the king's courtroom, there is a, 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 a Medes and Persian rule that says that if I come before the king without being invited, I will die and, and I will be executed. And so she, she tells her friends and she tells Mordecai, she said, fast and pray for me. And, and he, she said, on this, on, uh, then I will go, then I'll get dressed in the royal robes and go before the king. Last week we saw how uh, Esther goes, stands at a distance, and the king nods and smiles and lifts up the scepter uh, for her to touch, which means you're, you're welcome to come in. And he says something wonderful. I will give you half of the kingdom, whatever you desire. And she says, well, I desire that you show up and with Haman at a banquet uh, to, uh, tomorrow night. That's the first banquet uh, there. Uh, they, they feast. This is the night before the events that we see here. Uh, they feast. They, 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 uh, they, they celebrate. Uh, Esther just doesn't feel right about, about confronting Haman in this thing. So she's, she, at the end of the night when Xerxes says, what is it that you uh, desire? She says, I desire that you come back tomorrow night for round two of, the, of this banquet. And so that's when Haman leaves that place, all, all the flutter, all, all overjoyed until he runs into Mordecai, gets angry at Mordecai, and then plans to, to have Mordecai the very next day executed. Man, I tell you, they built gallows quickly, didn't they? Yeah, I, I don't know what kind of work crew did he have, but those gallows was up. A huge gallows was, was built up that evening. He was just overjoyed at, at this. And he had planned very early the very next morning to be the first one at the palace so that when, when the king wanted to ask him, he could rush in there and say, let me kill Mordecai. And he believed it from the past experience with the king that the king would just say, sure, and all of his problems would be solved. That was Haman's plan. That was not God's plan. Uh, and so, so as I look at as I look at this, chapter five and chapter six of Esther has to be my favorite chapters in in the in the book of Esther. It, it, the way things unfold, because it it demonstrates two things to to us that I think is vital for us to realize. First of all, it demonstrates God's control. God is ultimately completely in charge, even when you feel like things are completely out of, out of control. Esther and Mordecai, when they would look at this situation, probably felt, what's going to happen? Uh, it, seems to be, it seems to be barreling toward a, a foregone conclusion. But no, God would prove to them. And too often in our life, it, it was, sometimes we get sideswiped by the, by the realization that God's in control after all. That God's actually had him in his hand after all. But it also shows something else. I really like this. It shows the brilliance of God. You know, we were discussing the other day about the brilliance of this plan. This plan was just brilliant the way it worked out. The way, the way God orchestrated all the parts and the pieces. All the parts and the pieces had to fit for it to turn out the way it turned out. Everything that Haman did, everything that Esther did, everything that Mordecai did, everything that Xerxes did, all these things fell right into God's plan. God caused it to be so beautiful. How many of you have ever seen a symphony? Been to a symphony? Yeah, oh, good, good. Got some cultural people. <laughs> I, I, I've been to one symphony. I was, I was in elementary school, and I remember they ushered us in. They sat us down, and I remember, uh, I remember two major parts of a symphony. First of all, I remember, do you remember when they are starting out? They're tuning up, and you know, it sounds like the most awful thing I ever heard. I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to endure this. This is just awful. You know, but it was all of them pre preparing for it. And then all of a sudden, the conductor walks up, it starts. When he starts, all those terrible instruments comes together in such beautiful, rapturous harmony. And it changes the entire atmosphere of the place. And for the next hour or so, uh, there were some beautiful sounds that came from that, from that symphony uh, or orchestra. And so, so uh, when I think about that symphony orchestra, I think about life. We see life as those noisy Individual instruments. 
all the this part, this part, this part, this part. We see it as, as the things that are out of tune. We see it as the things that are just random. We see it as those things. But then the conductor steps forward. And when the conductor steps forward, he brings everything into perfect harmony. He brings everything under his control. He brings everything. And sometimes, I think sometimes he lets the tune-up last a long time so that we'll know the beauty. <laughs> The beauty of the, of the music, the beauty of the, of the majesty uh, of it all. That's what was happening with Esther. Esther's life was just, was, just, uh, was, was, uh, was just out of control. It seemed like everything was going south. It seemed like everything. Uh, she didn't know if, this, if, if it was going to work, this whole banquet thing. But little did she know that as much as she did, as much as she tried to do, she did very little compared to what God did. She obeyed very little compared to what God did. That, that speaks to us, doesn't it? If I just obey God in the simplest method and the simplest manner, then, then God's going to take care and, and carry, carry them up. So, so uh, tonight I, wanna, I want us to look at divine reversals. Divine reversals. It's, it's, uh, I, I, believe, I believe here in the Word of God we see uh, the, this matter of divine reversals. What is a divine reversal, Derek? First, a divine reversal is when everything looks certain to go in one direction, but God steps in and changes its course to uncover a glorious plan underneath it all. You know, uh, well, well how, how is, you know, is that biblical, Derek? For we know that all things work together for the good, for them that love the Lord, and are called according to his purposes. What does that mean? That if we are committed to God's purpose and plans and we love God, then, then we can be guaranteed that all things, the good, the bad, the ugly, will work together for the good uh, in, in our life. And that, that means there'll be times when the devil's plots and ploys and plans are reversed. They're, I mean, they're just, they're just turned on, the, on its ear. That is what we see. That is what happens here uh, in, in the Word of God. So let's, tonight, I want to take a look at a few factors involved in what I call these divine reversals. The first factor, as Hannah pointed out, is the timing of this divine reversal. The timing of this divine reversal. Everything had to be according to the clock. When I was a kid, I used to watch Mission Impossible. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, that, 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 that. that, that. But, and they would plan out that thing every step of the way. Everything had to happen according to the clock. Everything had to happen exactly what was right. This had to work according to the clock. This had to work according to what, to what God was doing uh, in our life. You see, sometimes you think that God is absent. He's not. Sometimes you feel like God is late. He's not. He's just not on your clock. <laughs> he is on his clock, his timing. And when his timing does its work, when his timing begins to unfold uh, in our life, then we begin to see the brilliance of it all. We begin to see what God has for our life. Now, look at this. Things are snowballing. Things are happening like they were just like, boom, this happened and that happened, this happened. As Michelle pointed out, by the end of that night, he's on his way to Esther's ball, <laughs> thinking, thinking that everything, well, maybe my day will turn out better. No, Mordecai, I mean, ha Haven is not turning out better. Things are going to change. Why? Because all of this was according to God's timing. See, first of all, I want you to notice an uncommon appointment. All of the king's appointment books had been closed. All of the king's plans for the day has been closed. He, dressed, he, he is dressed in his night clothes. He had climbed in bed. He had plucked his pillow. He had laid his head down. His day was over, and it seemed to be too late. Haman's plan was in motion. Everything was going exactly the way Haman wanted it to go. Uh, uh, things seemed to be clicking along uh, in, in this evil plot. But somebody stepped into that room and had an appointment with the king. And that someone was God. 
He doesn't follow your appointment book. He doesn't follow your plan. He doesn't follow. And, and notice what happened. The Bible says that Xerxes couldn't what? He couldn't sleep. Pay attention to those nights when you can't, can't sleep. It might be God saying, hey, I just need a little time with you. Just need a little time to, 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 to talk with you. So, so, so in the middle of it all, God makes an appointment. Now, I love, I love this. I love the wording of this. He said, that night, the king could not sleep. I love that phrase, that night. What does that mean? It means the night before Mordecai could ever show up. I mean, uh, before Haman could ever show up to bring condemnation to uh, Mordecai, God showed up uh, uh, to, 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 do, to do his work and to do uh, can I tell you, our God works the night shift. In the darkest situation, in your darkest circumstance, when it seems like things are too far gone, can I tell you that your God is a God that still works and still moves. Psalms 21, 121 and 4 says, Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. And, that, and, we, and that's a promise to you too. You've been grafted in into to Israel. And in other words, uh, he's concerning you. He's not slumbering. He's not sleeping. He takes very seriously. And if he has to do the work in the middle of the night, if he has to do the work at the very last minute, whatever he has to do, God's timing is perfect. He works the night shift. God doesn't miss a thing. Then, then I want you to notice that there was an uncommon Reminder. He calls in. How many people read if, they're, if they can't sleep? Do you have any readers here that, that, that they grab a book and they can't sleep? You know, uh, because it just relaxes you and everything. Well, he doesn't he didn't, didn't read when he couldn't sleep. He called in the scribes to read to him, you know. So, so he calls in the scribe to read to him. The scribe could have gr grabbed any scroll, couldn't he? No, he couldn't have. <laughs> he could only grab one scroll. It was the scroll that was written, the chronicle that was written on the day when Mordecai had told Esther of the plot to kill King Xerxes. And so this man is reading along and he reads the name Mordecai. And, and, he, he, and he's trying to relax, but he squirms a bit and he says, Mordecai, what was done for Mordecai for this great act that he did for us? And they said, nothing, king. And so that got the king's mind a worry. And I believe it was early, early in the morning and not in the, uh, when, when the king couldn't, still couldn't sleep when he gets up and he, and he says, who's in the courtyard? I want to know if there's anyone here that can help me. And they turn to him and says, king, he says, Haman is in the courtyard. And he calls him in to, uh, to, uh, 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 to, to, to ask his advice in this whole thing. You see, God would bring a reminder of what Haman would do. Have you ever done something for God and you feel like nobody noticed? You're wrong. Have you ever done something for God and you think it's insignificant and it's a minor thing? No, you're wrong. Hebrews 6 and 10 tells us this. I, li I, I like this text. No, that's, that's not Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6 and 10. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Paul says that for God to forget you would be unjust and our God is not unjust. For God to forget to reward you would be, would be unlike God. And you're like, well, isn't that earning God's favor? No, no. If you're a parent you, and, you, uh, and you've ever done this, and I, I've done it a few times with my kids, is when they've done something great, I take them out to celebrate. And it's not so much about what they've done, it's that daddy likes to celebrate <laughs> with his kids their, their accomplishments. I believe our father loves to celebrate when we obey him. I believe he loves to celebrate. And sometimes, sometimes that celebration might be postponed a while. Sometimes that celebration might be years. I believe it was years. I believe that, that that event happened somewhere along along in there. That it may have been years before uh, 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 this would happen. But it was all a part of God's glorious plan to bring about the promotion of Mordecai and the demotion 
of Haman. So, so, so we need to understand that God uses this time as, a, as an uncommon reminder in the middle of it all. And then, I like this. There was an uncommon significance. An uncommon significance. Too often we are prone to believe that our actions are insignificant in God's plan. That our acts of obedience, our faithfulness, is just something that God just, oh, well, that's just a little thing. But to God, our obedience is never insignificant. Can I make even a bolder statement? Nothing you've done for God is small. Because God doesn't see it that way. Because you're doing it for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're doing it for God himself. Even the smallest thing done for the greatest king is, is, is a major thing uh, in, in our life. You see, it was an uncommon significance. The thing that, that, that Mordecai thought was uh, un insignificant, oh, he, he would have done it for anybody. He would have spoken up for, for anybody and saved anybody's life in this thing. It was an insignificant thing. He didn't demand reward. He didn't do it for that. He did, Mordecai did it simply because it was the right thing to do. But God would use that which looked insignificant in a very significant time. Have you ever looked back over your past and you saw those little areas of your life that you thought was nothing at the time? But when you look back over it, you realize that was a monumental point in my life. That changed the tra trajectory of my path. That changed my future. That changed my life. That changed what it was. You see, it's, it's a it was an uncommon significance. I believe, I believe Mordecai and Esther from that point forward saw things very differently. They saw that there was a significance in, in, in serving God, a significance in doing what God had told us to do. Church, we need to, we need to stop, first of all, stop buying the lie that the devil wants to teach us that what we're doing for God is insignificant. What you're doing for God is being noticed. By heaven. What you're doing for God is being marked by. And one day, the king's books are going to be open. And I'm not talking about King Xerxes. I'm talking about the king of kings and the lord of lords. And you're going to be remembered. <laughs> and and, there's gonna, and it, it, it may be in the sweet by and by or it may be tomorrow. But you, the books will be open and, and, the, and the Bible says, in here, and when, you're, when you've been brought to remembrance to God, and, and you brought to remembrance that those insignificant things all of a sudden takes on the significance of God in your life. This tide of God's timing was unfurling. This tide of God's timing was, was changing everything. It was perfect. The, uh, there was an, a, a more opportune time. If, 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 this, if, if this whole event would have happened a day before, Mordecai would be day, dead. If it would happen a day later, Esther wouldn't have been able to, uh, to, to, to accomplish what she wanted to accomplish. God orchestrated every little detail according to his plan and his purpose. Yes. Also, not honoring Mordecai back then was part of it. Because if they had already done it, there wouldn't have been a exactly. reason to do it. Exactly. God's timing in rewards and God's timing in the recognition, God's timing in our promotion, God's timing in all these things falls right into his plan. Let me make that significant. This doesn't work with your plan. This is not about your, your plan for the future. This is about your part in God's plan. And when you surrender like Esther did to God's plan, boom. It just, uh, your life can unfold and, then, and it can hap it happen in your life. So we, we need to realize that. We need to embrace that uh, 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 in, in, in our life. We're going to see, too, the significance of the gallows. And, uh, and, you know, uh, you know that, that had a part in, in God's plan uh, of it all. So, so here, in, here in the Word of God, we see that t take place. Now, I want you to notice the irony of this divine reversal. The irony of this divine reversal. Irony is, is an expression or the use of a language that normally means one thing that can be used to mean something totally opposite of it. 
So, and we'll see the irony uh, that, that's, that, that's in this. As, as Melanie's already pointed out, God's got a sense of humor. He's, he's got a phenomenal sense of humor. He would play off the irony of what was happening. In, you see, God didn't need a plan. He just borrowed Haman's. <laughs> I love that. I love that. He's like, you know, I'm just, okay, that, that works. So he just borrows Haman's plan, turns it around for his glory, for his reward, for his, his system in our life. That's the irony of it all. That's the thing that makes this whole, this, this part of this story so, so hilarious and so, so wonderful. You see, he, notice, notice the, uh, the, uh, 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 that he, Haman would realize something uh, that, that, that God had already promised his people. In Genesis 12 and 3, he said, I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those, him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God made a promise to his people generations before. But he's still keeping it with Esther and Mordecai and his people far away in Persia. God made a promise with Abraham to God's people, and he's still keeping it today, 2023, in Freeport, Illinois. Yes. Well, and, and I think that even if we wrote that what the king said the next day to, to Hammond, mm -hmm. we couldn't have come up with a better way of doing it because he didn't say, for instance, he didn't say, I want you to celebrate Mordecai. Or, that's right. you know, he, he, and he made him think that it was for him, you know. That, that, that's right. That's right. He, well, I don't even think he intentionally did that. I think in his excitement, he just failed to mention that it wasn't for him. He didn't, he didn't assume that. Uh, you know, uh, Haman assumed, oh, right. yeah, well, they've been honoring me all week. I mean, I'm the star of this show. You know, and, and so, so it, it, all this just began to un, unfold in his life. So let, let's... Notice the irony of, of this whole thing. First of all, the irony was that the enemy planned. This was the plan of the enemy. And may I say, Haman is not the enemy. Amen? Haman was a puppet of the enemy. The enemy was Satan. And Satan had, had planned this and moved and moved it and, and God, in his wisdom, turned this whole thing, you know, whole thing around. It wasn't by chance that Haman was in the courtyard when the king says who's in the courtyard. Haman showed up early that day. He was excited. He had a brand new gallows out there. He thought that by the end of this this. That by lunchtime, I'll have Mordecai dangling from uh, from a hangman's noose, and he and he was there excited about that. And when he got invited in, he's like, "Here it goes, here it goes." And he walk, he walks, he walks into that that room. And when he asked him, "How can I order? How can I honor this man?" <coughs> Haman holds back none of the stuff. <laughs> notice what he did. I want you to notice. I want you to notice what Haman's answer was. I love this. Let a royal robe be brought, which the king has worn. Not just a robe, one of your robes, king. He said, and a horse on which the king has ridden. Not just a horse, one of your horses, king. He said, which has a royal crest placed on its head, so that everybody can know where it's coming from. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Now this tells me something about Haman. Haman wanted to be king. He desired to be king. He desired to wear the robe of the king, ride the horse of the king, to be declared like the king was, to be heralded through the, to, through the streets. This shows us the ultimate heart and the ultimate deception of, of, of Haman. But Haman unfurls all these things before him. He, here's the plan for the best honor. And then the king turns around. I, uh, I, 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 just, I, 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 I love this story. The, the king turns around and says, good, fine. Go do it for Mordecai. <laughs> See, the enemy participated in it. 
God would use this whole situation to cause the enemy to do what God wanted him to, to do. Notice, notice, what, notice the very words of, of the king. Then the king said to Haman, hurry, take the robe and the horse as you have suggested. And do so for Mordecai the Jew, who sits within the king's gate, leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. That was the first time that the king had said the, had said the word Mordecai. Haman was like, where is this coming from? <laughs> and the really ironic part about it is, you go back to the birth before that, mm -hmm. the king even suggested, take one of my, the most noble prince, princes. Well, as we re read through some of these first five chapters, there doesn't appear to be very many princes that are much higher than Haman. That's so right. it was, that just went by Haman. He was so wrapped up in his plan that he didn't even foresee that it might backfire on him because the king, there, weren't, there wasn't going to be anybody else to parade oh, Haman on. Yes, yes. And that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God's going to use you move through you, touch you, at times bless you if he's got to use the devil to do it. Well, we see in the, in the New mm -hmm. Testament when we've been studying Acts with Paul. Paul, the, the last few weeks has been beat up, thrown in prison mm -hmm. and everything else and Jesus himself comes to him and says, you've testified for me in Jerusalem. Yes. Now you're going to testify in Rome. That's right. That's right. The plan was set out. Just like here, the you're not going to get beat up. I'm mm -hmm. going. You're not going to die. You are going to roam eventually. That's right. God's God's plan is going to ultimately unfold, and oftentimes He would He He will cause it to unfold according to by using the most unlikely tools and instruments. There's an old adage that I used to be. Uh, uh, that, that used to be said when I was a young boy, I hadn't heard it much now, is watch out who you step on on your way up. Because you may face them on your way back down. And, and Haman was stepping on Mordecai. And, and he was about to come down very, very quickly. And then, then uh, uh, thirdly, uh, the enemy proclaimed it. I, 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 like, I like that. In that, in that, uh, th that, uh, uh, that th that was part of his instruction. Notice what part of his instruction uh, was. He said, so Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, thus shall it be done to the man who the king delights to honor. God would use Haman to vocally bless Mordecai. Do you know what Mordecai said as in response? Nothing. Mordecai could have been petty and could have been proud and could have been arrogant and could have and could have uh, and could have been strutting around and could have used this as a as a case for revenge. But Mordecai was a righteous man. And after the day was done, when when Haman was sulking and walking home, well, you know, was head covered. Mordecai took off the robes, went back to the, his seat at, at the gate and sat down. Same Mordecai he was that morning. The same person he was, was, that, was that day. But that day, God had caused his very enemy to bless him. Now, how, how does that apply to our life? Uh, uh, I, it's not, in, it's not in, in our text. Isaiah 54, 17. This caught my attention. He said, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Hear this. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. God said, I'll even use their tongues that they were using as a weapon against you, against them. We see that, we see that here in Mordecai, Mordecai's life. Uh, so, so, so that, that's that's such a powerful that's such a powerful uh, truth. And then I want us to notice the impact of this divine reversal, how how it unfolded, how how what kind of impact uh, that 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 it made. Uh, uh, you know, uh, even even 
The wife knew things had changed. You know you went in trouble when your wife puts her hands on her hips and looks you square in the eye and gives you a little bit of information that you really don't care to, to, to hear uh, at the moment. That's what ha Haman had waiting for him when he got home. He got home and there was that wife. You see, because she realized something, there had been a change in status, in our status. There had been a change in Mordecai's status. Mordecai was no longer just a stranger that wouldn't bow to Haman. Mordecai was not just another man sitting at the gate. He was not just another uh, a judge that was there doing his duty. No, Mordecai had been recognized by the king. Mordecai had been noticed by the king. Things had begun to change. And when God turns things around, don't be surprised if God doesn't change your status in the, in the, in the process. God doesn't change your position in, 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 in the middle of a... Let's, let's listen to what she said. I, I, I like this. When Haman told his wife Zeresh, who, by the way, this was her idea, mm -hmm. and all his friends, everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife Zeresh, Zeresh, wise men, get that? Yeah. Uh, and his wife Zeresh said to him, if Mordecai before whom you have begun to fall is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but you will surely fall before him. She said, this Mordecai, because he's of Jewish descent, everything that you had planned is beginning to unravel. And she didn't know how prophetic she really was. Because as soon as she said it, the knock came at the door. As soon as she said it, uh, he thought, well, this day is finally over. I get to go get to go sit at a nice, lavish banquet and be honored by the king and the queen. Wrong. Very, very, very wrong. Why? Because God had changed his status. God, the, the word of God tells us that it is God that exalts and God that abases. That promotion you got is not because you're so talented. You know, that raises you guys not because you did, that you just worked harder than everybody else. I believe God works and, and moves in our everyday lives. He is the one that exalts. He's the one that abases. Uh, Paul says at one point that, if we, that, 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 we, that, uh, that we will be exalted in due time if we faint not. That we will, that we will ex we experience that, pro that, that spirit of promotion. Our status will Change And it wasn't for Haman's, I mean, for Mordecai's glory. It wasn't even for Esther's glory, but it was for God's glory. God wants to change your status, not so that you can say, look how great I am, but you can say, look how great my God is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I. I just wonder if Haman ever read the book of Job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it turned out that Job's friends turned out to be his worst enemy. That's right. That, that's right. Okay, and, they they devised a plan for him when it fails. They said, "Well, you must stop." Oh, that's right. That's right. Don't look at us. That, that's you right. Must up. Maybe Job's friends were related to these <laughs> friends of Haman too. Like, <laughs> could, could have been descendants, couldn't it? Could have been descendants. And and I just I think it's funny they were called wise men. <laughs> They're not very wise. You know, but uh, uh, and, and 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 so 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 uh, uh, we see we see here a change in in status. We also see here a change in direction. The direction of Mordecai would change. Direction of Esther would change. The direction of of Haman would change. Yes, it would. The direction of King Xerxes would change. The direction of the Persian Empire would change. When God begins to orchestrate what he has uh, in our life, there's a lot of change. Can I tell you, you've been praying for God to promote you, you've got to be willing to change. You've been praying for God to, to bless you in this area or that area or to use you in this area or that area. When that season arrives, it's going to be a season of radical change in your life. You've got to trust God with the change. You gotta trust God that He's got it under control. You gotta trust God that on the end, that, that when all of this stuff finishes changing, that your direction would be changed for His glory and, and, and His grace. That's a very powerful principle that we need to realize. And then finally, it changes everything that follows. History would be changed. The Persian Empire would be changed. 
all the events that would unfold. We're not, we're not, we're not finished yet. <laughs> God's going to, this is just, this thing, this thing's just starting. Next week, we're going to see Haman stepping into that, into that, into that final uh, 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 banquet hall uh, with Esther and, and, and Haman. I mean, Esther and Xerxes. We're going to see how that unfolds. Uh, how many of you love it when you're really in, enthralled in a, in a great show, a great program, and those terrible words flash up there, to be continued? <laughs> you go, ah, I knew this was getting too good for, uh, and you know that, and it's not so bad now because, you know, you, if you're streaming, you just go next, <laughs> you, you know, you know, in our day, y'all know what I'm talking about, oh no, it's a week, and it's got, it can't be a chore night, it can't be a night when I have to take a bath, it can't be this, uh, or if there's something happens, I'm going to miss it, and then I'm going to have, I'm gonna have I always missed it, I'm going to have to wait until it comes around for again report. for yeah. the summer <laughs> program, <laughs> the reruns, that's, that's right. And, and, and so that's how I feel at the, at, at the end of this, is that we know that everything that follows will be radically changed by God's reversal and God's transform, transformation uh, uh, in, in our life. So we need, to, we need to say, Lord God, help us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to, to be willing to change. Uh, have you ever noticed that, that, uh, that transformation is a part of God's story for us? That us changing is part of what he has in store for us. From the time he started saving us, he started transforming us and changing us and making us in his own image and, 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 and transformation. Who he wants you to be is far greater than you can ever imagine or ever dream or ever, or ever lay your hand on. But it requires the, the key that Esther knew to surrender your life into his hands. It's say, God, I, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you with this life. I'm going to trust you with what, what you have in, 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 in store for me. And then watch for his time. Watch for the irony of, 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 you know, that thing that's supposed to do you, do you in? It doesn't do you in. It blesses you instead. instead. Ask Joseph who said that, that you meant for evil, God meant for good. God was going to, the irony of God's divine reversal uh, in, in, in his life. So, so here's some very important principles in our life. Uh, embrace God. Love God. Be called according to his purpose. And, and, and then watch God work all things together for the good. That does not mean that all things, is good, all things are good. That's a misreading of that text. That means that all things will work together for the good. Even the bad. Even the disastrous. <laughs> even our failures. God will orchestrate, if we give it to him, to work together for his glory and for his good. God bless you. We pre appreciate you uh, for coming out uh, uh, tonight and being a, being a part of us. Oh. Can you give me a reference from Isaiah? Okay.